This is the story of the founder of Hyundai, Chang Juyin. Chang Juyin was born in 1915 in a small village in Korea. His career goal was to become a teacher, but he wasn't able to learn much because his family was so impoverished. He had to labor in the fields as a child to support his family, but occasionally, even after working so hard, they were unable to feed one another. Disregard appropriate attire and medical attention. To sell wood, Chung had to travel to a nearby city. He observed that the locals were not working all day in the fields and that they had adequate clothing and food. He was really angry and depressed after realizing all of that. For himself, he desired a better life. He once signed the papers that workmen were needed at a large construction site in a nearby city. He was inspired to act by this news. Chung took a bold choice in 1932, when he was just 16 years old. He intended to flee to the city. Chung and his companion stealthily headed into the city one evening. After traveling around 160 kilometers on foot, he arrived in Kowon City and began working as a construction laborer. It was arduous labor for pitiful pay. For the first time in his life, Chung was able to support himself financially, which made him pleased. This was how his life went on for around two months, until he was apprehended. When Ching's father discovered him, he was forced to return to farming. Chung was not pleased to see him again, even though his family was. Chung had developed a fascination for civil engineering and building throughout these two months. Furthermore, he was aware that laboring in the fields would never be enough to lift him out of poverty, and for that reason, he made two more attempts to flee. But his father always found him. At last, in 1934, he tried to escape four times, and this time, at the age of 18, no one stopped him. He arrived in Seoul, which serves as South Korea's current capital. He completed the tasks he could find there. He worked as a construction laborer first, then as a worker in a factory, and lastly he was hired as a delivery boy at the Bok Young Rice store. His work so delighted both the customers and the shop owners that he was promoted to manager of the store within six months. Chung put a lot of effort into expanding the store after that. The proprietor of the store made an unexpected choice in 1937 after becoming gravely ill. He gave Chung the store because of his diligence. Chung had gone from being an employee to the owner of a business at the age of 22. Chung put forth even more effort over the course of the following two years, earning the market's respect and trust, which enabled him to expand his company. Things were going great until all of a sudden there was a disaster. Korea was under Japanese occupation during World War II. Japan seized over all the rice stores in Korea, including Ching's rice business, because they wanted to ensure that their army would have an adequate supply of rice during the war. All of his laborious efforts were suddenly destroyed. Chang felt dejected, but he persisted. I will undoubtedly succeed if I truly put my heart and soul into whatever work I am doing. After having this idea, he began hunting for a company that the Japanese government couldn't take over. He soon turned his attention to the auto repair industry. With a 3,000 won loan, he started in a do service garage in 1940. But this time, he had the terrible misfortune that the garage caught fire just a month after it had opened, destroying everything in its path. Chung was in a very challenging circumstance. He was required to reimburse his clients for the loss and pay back his debt. A typical individual would give up in this circumstance with ease. But as usual, Chung tackled the issue head-on. He constructed a nicer garage after taking out a second loan of 3,500 won. Chung came to the conclusion that the length of time it took for consumers to get their automobiles fixed was the main issue. He made speed his primary goal as a result. Chung's garage could do certain repairs in five days compared to his competitors' 20 days. His garage was so successful that he hired 80 people over the course of the following three years or until 1943. Chung had relocated his family to Seoul and paid back the entire amount by this point. The business was expanding quickly when another calamity occurred. Japan had to produce military hardware for the Second World War. Japan thus acquired possession of his garage and combined it with a nearby steel mill. He lost his business to others once more. Chan had returned to the starting point. He had no choice but to take his family back to his village. However, he had saved up 50,000 won this time, and he had no doubts about starting another company. The end of World War II also brought an end to Japanese authority over Korea. America influenced the southern part of Korea, 
whereas the Soviet Union influenced the northern part. During World War II, they both fought the battle against Japan. Korea was split into North and South Korea for this reason. In 1946, Chung returned to Seoul and reopened his auto repair shop. Although the name was new, the business was not. Hyundai Vehicle Repair Hyundai is a contemporary word. While Ching's auto repair business was booming, he realized that the United States was erecting structures for its armed forces. He saw a huge opening in the building industry. His construction experience was limited. However, he continued to be passionate about construction, just as he had when he was a worker in the past. That's the reason he started the Hyundai Civil Works Company in 1947 when he was 31 years old and went into the construction industry. At first, he received a lot of little contracts, but as the 1950s progressed, his company began to receive large construction projects, and this was his main concern now. Things were going well, but the story took a turn for the better. North Korea attacked South Korea in June 1950. Troops from North Korea were approaching Seoul. Chung had to use all of his savings to flee to Pusan because of this. But Chung persisted despite such a significant setback. At the time, South Korea and the U.S. Army were engaged in combat with the North Korean Army. They also need army headquarters, depots, and tents. Chung noted that wealth was not a problem for Americans. All they wanted was dependable and prompt delivery. Chung then handed it to them. He embraced the can-do motto at first and had a small staff. They would take on any building project if the price was right. There was a battle going on, and he had to deal with numerous issues and losses. However, he never abandoned a project once he made a commitment. Owing to his dependability, he established close bonds with Americans. Even after the war ended in 1952, Chung kept receiving contracts from the United States. Later, the South Korean government started constructing roads, bridges, and dams quickly in an effort to restore the nation. Hyundai was a prominent player in all of this and saw rapid commercial expansion. Hyundai is the manufacturer of the largest dam in South Korea, the Soying Dam, and the most significant highway, the Kyungbu Highway. Chung was in his early 50s and the owner of a prosperous construction company in the 1960s. He wasn't happy about this, though. It was time to construct cars that could travel on the thousands of kilometers of roads that Chung had previously constructed. Chung founded the Hyundai Motor Company in 1967. He had an agreement with Ford in 1968 to produce the Curtina vehicles. For two years, this joint venture was a profitable endeavor. Conflicts between the two companies then began to arise. Ford opposed Hyundai producing its own automobiles. For this reason, Chung broke up with that relationship in 1973 and began seeking for new ones right away. He made an effort to collaborate with Volkswagen and General Motors on their manufacturing technologies, but none of them gave in. Ultimately, they teamed up with Mitsubishi Motors of Japan that same year. Mitsubishi was prepared to provide its automaking technologies to Hyundai. The finest element of the agreement was that Hyundai was allowed to sell its own vehicles. The South Korean government ordered automakers to produce a citizen's car at about the same period. A reasonably priced, dependable vehicle with entirely South Korean-made parts. Hyundai produced the Hyundai Pony, South Korea's first mass-produced automobile, in 1976 after Chung established a new facility. This car was so successful in South Korea because it was so affordable. Hyundai ended up with 60% of the market there. It grew to be South Korea's largest automobile manufacturer. There was a catch, though. Only 30,000 cars made up South Korea's entire auto market. It wasn't enough to turn a profit. Additionally, Hyundai Pony was a complete failure in international markets despite its success in South Korea. The car's quality was subpar. The heat would cause the paint to fade. And it had mechanical problems a lot. Hyundai Motor Company has lost money for the previous seven years as a result of these factors. Chung was advised by others to shut down the business right away but everyone was taken aback by Ching's choice. Rather than closing, he intended to construct a new auto factory that would produce 300,000 cars a year. The management of the corporation found this choice incomprehensible. In a market with 30,000 automobiles, who will purchase 3 million cars, Chang, however, knew the solution. The economy of South Korea was expanding quickly, and thousands of people there were gaining economic independence annually. 
This indicated that in the upcoming years, there would be a sharp rise in the demand for cars. Furthermore, Hyundai designed its new vehicles with exports to other nations in mind. This facility was constructed in 1980, and Hyundai debuted the more improved Pony 2 in 1982. This vehicle was a commercial success not only in South Korea, but also in Africa, Latin America, and Canada. Hyundai turned a profit and sold 400,000 vehicles in the ensuing years. Now, Hyundai was recognized as a respectable automobile manufacturer on a global scale. Yet the USA, the world's largest and most competitive auto market, remained in tap. Internationally, it was crucial for a competent automotive business to succeed in the USA in order to grow into a big player. Hyundai discovered that Japan had dominated the compact vehicle industry after researching the US market. Additionally, there is already fierce rivalry in the mid to large sized American automobile industry. Hyundai chose to focus on the subcompact car segment because there was little to no competition in this market. Hyundai also observed that the United States had a sizable market for used cars. They charged the price of a used automobile for their brand new Hyundai Excel, along with a five year warranty, no less. The US auto industry was rocked by this tactic. Buyers of used cars quickly switched to the Hyundai Excel. Hyundai sold over 170,000 Excels in the United States in 1986. They sold over 260,000 automobiles in 1987. The Hyundai Excel rose to the top of the US import car sales charts during these years. No other automaker had experienced such early success in the US market up until that point. And with that, Hyundai became a well-known automobile manufacturer on a worldwide scale. In that year, Chung became the honorary chairman of Hyundai after retiring at the age of 72. Following that, his brothers and sons led and operated the business with the same level of tenacity. Hyundai is currently the third biggest automaker in the world. They sold nearly 40 million cars in 2022 alone. Despite this, Hyundai is best recognized for its automobile industry worldwide. However, relatively few individuals are aware that the Hyundai Group consists of 42 enterprises. For instance, the largest shipbuilding firm in the world, Hyundai Heavy Industries, Hyundai Elevator, and Hyundai Information Technology. Furthermore, South Korea has surpassed Japan to overtake Japan as the nation that builds the most ships worldwide thanks to Hyundai. Hyundai is not your typical South Korean firm. Hyundai is a national treasure that brought about reconstruction, thousands of jobs, and international prominence for South Korea, and a country youngster who lacked even the most basic necessities food, health care, and education was the one who started it all. However, he possessed a great deal of vision, enthusiasm, and above all a desire for improvement. 